Welcome everyone to our webinar titled Prairie Mountain Health Safe Client Handling Program facilitated by the Loop Fall Prevention Community of Practice. Uh, my name is Michelle Dukeman. I am the Knowledge Translation Coordinator for the Fall Prevention Program at Parachute. Uh, and Parachute is now sponsoring um, the Fall Prevention Communities Communities of Practice, Loop and Loop Junior, along with the annual Fall Prevention Month campaign, uh, which is currently running. Uh, before we begin, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items during the webinar. If you do have any questions about the technology um, or in, in general, please type them into the chat box. Um, my colleague, Ellen, will be monitoring this. But if you have any questions for our pres presenters specifically about the webinar, please submit them through the Q&A box. Um, it's at the bottom of your screen. Um, and those are going to be answered at the end of the webinar. You will only be able to view questions questions you have asked and not questions posed uh, by other participants. This webinar is being recorded and a, a YouTube link will be sent out to all participants in about one week along with uh, the presentation slides. So you can uh, view previous webinar recordings simply by heading over to the webinar page on Loop and click on archived webinars. You can also access the archived webinars from the services drop down menu on uh, Loop's homepage. Um, so you can see that there. I would like now to introduce our presenters, uh, Nan Nancy Tragana uh, and her Brandon University nursing students, Yvonne, Jada, and Nico. Uh, Nancy is an innovation and quality improvement specialist at Prairie Mountain Health uh, and co-chairs her regional fall prevention committee, uh, committee rather, and sits on two loop subcommittees. Uh, Yvonne, Jada, and Nico are fourth year nursing students completing a placement in community health uh, and who are expected to graduate in 2022. For a complete bio on our presenters, please take a look at uh, the Zoom webinar invitation or check out the Loop uh, event calendar. So without further ado, please take it away, Nancy, and you can start sharing your screen. Thank you so much, Michelle. So I will make sure. I click the right button, hopefully. <laughs> and we'll start from the beginning. Okay. Okay. Um, so are we good? Can we see the slides? Yep, can see them. Perfect. Thank you. No um, so I'd like to start to... I'd like to start today with um, a land acknowledgement. So really, what is the significance of land acknowledgement? Land acknowledgement for Indigenous people is a tradition that dates back centuries, whereby visitors from other nations would always acknowledge the territories they were visiting as part of their greetings. For many non-Indigenous Canadians, officially recognizing the territory or lands we stand on is a fairly new concept. Land acknowledgement can also be interpreted as an act of reconciliation. It's a small step, but our acknowledgement pays respect and recognizes the enduring relationship that Indigenous people have with the land. Today, I wish to acknowledge that Prairie Mountain Health is located in Treaty 2 and 4 territory and is the homeland of the Métis. And I further acknowledge that within the geographical area of Prairie Mountain Health, the Indigenous populations are the Cree, Dakota, OJ Cree, and the Métis. So here are pictures of our lovely Brandon University students. Uh, Jada, Nico, and Yvonne will be doing the actual presentation today. And so I just wanted to, before we begin our presentation, just kind of give you an idea as to where Prairie Mountain Health is. It's a large geographical area, about 67,000 kilometers um, in size, located in Western Manitoba. It runs from the Saskatchewan Manitoba border down to the US border and over to Lake Manitoba. And the population is about 171,000, and that makes up about 13% of Manitoba's population. We have 55 municipalities, which include the cities of Brandon and Dauphin. We have 20 hospitals, 43 long-term care homes, 
one orthopedic rehab center and nine transitional care sites, along with numerous community health centers. So now what I'm going to do is pass the screen over to my students. Thank you, Nancy, for the introduction. Um, as we all know, November is Falls Prevention Month. So I am going to start off our presentation by talking a little bit about falls and the effects of falls. So as we all know, falls and fall-related injuries are a serious problem in acute care hospitals. Um, falls are generally a safety hazard that threaten the effectiveness, efficiency, and timeliness of care rendered to a patient. The falls are associated with increased length of stay, increased healthcare costs, and higher rates of discharge from hospitals to long-term care facilities. Um, falls are generally defined as an unplanned descent to the floor with or without injury to a patient. So they are very prevalent in hospitalized adult populations and even more common in older patients over 65 years of age. A report by Carlos in 2016 stated that over 84% of all adverse effects that occur in hospitals are associated with falls. Next slide, please. So like I'm going to start with an, a little bit of a statistics on falls. I would just like us to keep in mind that this is not the most recent data. However, it is going to give us a broad idea of um, the uh, statistics of falls. So like I said before, falling is more serious among older adults because it is more common and can have more devastating consequences. Although falls are considered very common over the age of 65 years, it should not be considered an inevitable consequence of aging. They are, uh, falls are the leading cause of injury among older Canadians with about 20 to 30% of seniors experiencing one or more falls each year. And with those falls, close to about 20% of those seniors die within a year of the falls. Also, the falls cause about 85% of seniors related um, hospitalizations and 95% of hip fractures that are reported in hospitals. They tend to lead to hosp longer hospitalizations and the average Canadian seniors hospital stay is 10 days longer for falls than for any other causes. In addition, they result in chronic pain reduced mobility, loss of independence, and even death. Next slide, please. So what is the number of falls that have, have been reported in Prairie Mountain Health with, uh, within 2020 to 2021? So the total number of client falls reported in Prairie Mountain Health during the 2020 to 2021 fiscal year was about 6,459 falls. The type of outcome reported was 5,876 incidents, 572 close calls, seven critical incidents, and one critical occurrence. Reported client falls has decreased by 8% in 2020 to 2021 and 6% in 2019 to 2020. The most frequent type of fall that was reported in Prior Mountain Health Region was found on the floor with about 2,331 reports or about 36% of all the reported falls. Multiple contributing factors can be selected for each client fall. The top three most reported contributing factors in the Prior Mountain Health Region were behavior or mental status, followed by physical or medical status, and then gait. In the Prairie Mountain Health Region, more than 20 falls are reported in PMH facilities. So this table is just a representation of the client falls that have been reported from 2015 to 2021 in the Prairie Mountain Health Region. Looking at the number of falls from 2015 to 2021, we can see that there hasn't been that much of a significant increase or decrease in the number of falls reported. Um, our next slide is just gonna give us a visual representation of these numbers. So here is the graph showing the numbers of falls reported each month 
in 2020 to 2021. So um, looking at the graph, we, as I said earlier, there hasn't been much of a significant change. Um, however, we must consider that there are several contributing factors that affect the number of falls reported each month. For instance, the number of falls reported may be due to multiple falls by one or two high-risk fall fires. Let's consider Mr. A, for instance, who may have had a total fall of 10 in the month of November. This increases the number of falls in November in the entire region by 10, even though all those 10 falls were occurred with one client. Next slide, please. So our screenshot here is um, an image showing the PMH um, incident reporting system. Um, so when staff go to report an incident, they choose from a category that best suits the incident to be reported. When reporting a fall, for instance, contributing factors such as footwear, environmental conditions, cognitive or behavioral status attract. Results from the reporting system can identify trends such as the time of the day and the contributing factors that uh, causes the fall. Um, I believe this is um, popular everywhere, but in the Prairie Mountain Health region, staff are encouraged to always report incidents, including near misses. Next slide, please. I'm just going to talk a little bit about some risk factors associated with increased inpatient falls. As we know, there are many risk factors that may contribute to patient falls in the inpatient hospitals. Um, the risk factors, however, are classified as either intrinsic or extrinsic. The intrinsic factors are patient-related factors such as age, comorbidity, previous falls, gait, visual or auditory impairment, incontinence, musculoskeletal deficits, and cognitive impairment. Whereas our extrinsic factors are related to the physical environment of the hospital, be it medications to supportive and assistive equipment in bathrooms, lighting, and footwear. Next slide, please. So what are the consequences associated with falls? Um, I thought it would be interesting to group these consequences under social, physical, psychological, or emotional consequences. So I found that there, have, there were a lot of um, consequences associated with falls, and some of the social consequences included loss of independence, um, a change to a patient's daily routine, financial costs associated with the hospitalizations, and loss of social contacts that may be due to the long-term hospitalizations associated with the falls. The physical um, effects are fractures, which are very common, lacerations, brain injuries, dislocations, and even death. The psychological or emotional effects may include one's frustration at losing their independence to carry out their daily activities, the fear of falling again, which is very common, the stress resulting from uncertainty and anxiety after suffering from a fall or a fall-related injury, and embarrassment from the injury, or uh, generally a loss of self-esteem due to the inability to take care of yourself after falling. I will now hand over to Jada, who will talk about the Safe Client Handling and PMH's Safe Client Handling Program. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, next. So I will now discuss the purpose of safe client handling. To start with a fun fact, clients used to be physically picked up by care providers when they needed to be transferred. Healthcare providers were, requir were required to complete strength training in order to manually lift clients. We can now see how that would be unsafe for both clients and staff and could eventually lead to staff burnout. Now we have safe client handling programs that minimize the risk of injury to clients and staff in high-risk activities, such as lifting, transferring, ambulating, and repositioning. A safe client handling program can lead to a decrease in healthcare provider injuries and improved job satisfaction, 
while decreasing the organization's overall work injury costs. An effective safe client handling program decrease an effective safe client handling program includes active involvement of healthcare providers to utilize assessment tools, resource options of lift equipment, and assistive devices to reduce or eliminate the risk of injury. Next. The safe client handling program in Prairie Mountain Health has three main components. The first component is the assessment tool, which includes assessing the client and using tools such as communication poster boards to relay the important information regarding client handling to other staff. The second component is the ACEs screen that will be discussed in more detail later in this presentation. The third component involves the training of staff to properly use the various handling equipment and devices and in safe ergonomics and procedures to minimize injury risk. Next. Prairie Mountain Health Safe Client Handling Policy provides direction on the safe client handling program and outlines the roles and responsibilities that healthcare providers, including managers, have to the program. The policy requires the completion of safe client handling education by the healthcare provider on hire and minimally every three years. There is also ongoing review and evaluations of the safe client handling program at a minimum every three years or when there's a change in legislation. So just to give a little insight about the PMH policy, it states that PMH promotes a minimal lift environment for all client handling and movement. Manual lifting, such as lifting a client under the arm, manually lifting a client off the floor, manually transferring a client in a bed without a friction reduction device, or manually pulling or boosting a client in a wheelchair is not supported at best practice, as best practice unless in an emergency or life-threatening situation. Emergency or life-threatening situations could include code green or code blue disaster codes. Prairie Mountain Health does not have a restriction to lifting, but supports a minimal lift policy to minimize injury to staff and patients. Next. The safe client handling assessment involves the use of regional documents that were developed to ensure consistency across all facilities in PMH for assessing the transfer status of clients. They were designed to be flexible to include different transfer aids and can be customized to the client's unique needs. Staff training on the assessment portion is required every three years. Next. Uh, so the safe client handling assessment tool is completed on each client admission when the client status changes regarding transfers, uh, when there are concerns identified in the ACEs screen, or when there are concerns identified in the ACEs screen. The, tr the assessment form is to be completed only by the nurse, occupational therapist, physiotherapist, or musculoskeletal injury prevention specialist. The, trans the transfer status of the client is communicated using communication posters or logos. So how does this work? On admission, the nurse completes the safe client handling assessment tool, and they may consider a referral to therapy services if the client requires uh, further assessment. The safe client handling document is signed, dated, and the recommended method of transfer for the client is initiated. The communication board is filled out with the client's transfer status and is documented in the client's care plan. The ACEs screen is used whenever the healthcare providers are transferring the client to determine if there has been a change in the client's condition. After any change in the client's condition, the care plan must be updated accordingly. Next. So how is this assessment performed? The assessment tool is divided into four sections, which are the client information section, bed mobility, transfer assessment, and the communication section, which we will each go into, into detail. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the first section of the client 
the safe client handling assessment tool that is used across facilities in Prairie Mountain Health. Uh, there's the standard location for the patient sticker at the top left corner. There are also instructions on how to complete the form listed at the top. And then any additional instructions can be found in Appendix A of the PMH safe client handling policy that we've already discussed. If the client is able to move in bed and transfer independently, we do not need to complete any further assessment at this time. There are check boxes and spaces to initial for each section on the form. So in the client information section, some areas that we focus on are, is the client um, able to move in bed and transfer independently, their ability to follow directions, their weight bearing status, the equipment that they needed prior to admission and their level of pain control. Next. So this is the next section of the form, the bed mobility assessment, which determines the level of assistance and friction reduction devices needed to safely move the client. In this portion of the assessment, the client is asked to roll side to side, bridge and move side to side. While completing the bed mobility assessment, the healthcare provider starts from the box on the left and must select yes to each checkbox within a specific bed mobility type. If the answer is no to any checkbox in this section, you move to the adjacent box until the answer is yes to all boxes. Then that particular bed mobility option will be the status for the patient. There is also um, additional space at the bottom to detail more specific equipment that may be needed for individualized clients. So the next slide will demonstrate a video on how to complete this bed mobility section. So this video is intended to go through the bed mobility assessment portion of the safe client handling assessment form. So um, what we're going to go through is kind of the steps that you would look at and a little bit of rationale as to what you're, uh, what you're looking for in terms of um, assist for bed mobility and how to fill out the form. So the first thing I'm going to have Jen do is bend up her knees as far as she can. And this will depend on the client that you have and how good their knees are as well. But most of the, the movements you're going to be doing in bed are going to require them to be in this position. So we're going to start with rolling side to side um, and we are going to look at rolling to side to side uh, both ways uh, just because depending on someone's abilities they may be able to roll independently to one side but not to the other. On this bed we do have a rail so if you have railings on the bed uh, and someone is used to using that by all means encourage them to do so. Uh, anything that we can do to relieve the stress on the caregivers is great. So Jen I'm going to get you to roll towards your right side for me and if you want to use the rail that's great. So you're just looking at their ability to complete the movement and how much assist they're requiring to do that. In this case, um, Jen is doing it independently. If they couldn't roll over in bed, you would um, assess if they could uh, need a one or a two person assist. Um, if there are sliders in place, you might uh, choose to look at uh, utilizing those as well. Um, having said that, if you're requiring to utilize sliders, uh, that will impact the rest of the assessment as well because generally that's indicating uh, a fair amount of weakness and they're not going to be able to complete the rest. Um, Jen, do you want to roll back over onto your back for me? Good. And then again, see what their capabilities are moving over onto their other side as well. Good. And then you can roll onto your back. The next thing that we want to look at is uh, just looking at how much strength Jen has in, in her core and in, in her extensors, which will indicate to us whether or not uh, we're going to be looking at doing a stand and how much assist we might need for that. So with the knees bent up, Jen's going to lift her bum up off the bed. Um, it is okay if someone is having a fair bit of difficulty with this to give, you know, just a little bit of help with supporting the feet. Um, just know that if you're having to hold their feet in place for them to do this movement, that is an indication that there is some weakness and you certainly do want to make sure you have a second person on hand to help with, with the rest of the assessment. So what we're looking at here is how strong is Jen. Right now she's got her legs in line with her body so she's got a, a great amount of core strength there uh, and she's doing very well. She's got her bum cleared off the bed. If she's kind of coming down like this and she's not fully extending, 
she's not able to clear her bum right off a bit, that is an indication again that there's some weakness there and you are going to want to grab a, a second set of hands to, to complete the rest of the transfer. Alrighty, you can lower your bum for a second, thank you. Um, the next step that we're going to look at is just what's Jen's ability to move um, kind of side to side in bed because oftentimes you come into uh, a room your client might be to one side of the bed farther than the other so in order to g move on to the next step we want to make sure that they are fairly centered in the bed so we're not going to roll them off the floor there isn't the fear of doing that so from this position I'm just going to check Jen's ability to move over to um, her, her left side okay. at this point so, so we're going to move your feet first over then we're going to get you to lift your bum and then it basically kind of falls over to that side and then Jen's ability to bring her shoulders forward with her okay and so now we're going to move to the other side so move your feet over good lift your bum and over it comes and then the shoulders will follow good and that basically completes the bed mobility portion of the assessment So this next section of the assessment form is completing the transfer assessment, and it is used to determine the client's strength, balance, and functional mobility. To determine if the client is able to get in or out of bed on their own, we consider if the client can sit on the edge of the bed, do they need support while doing so, and can they lean forward and push up from the bed? Other questions we ask are, is the client able to stand supporting their weight? and can they take a step forward and back. In this section, a client can be classified as a supervised transfer, one person minimum assist, two person minimum assist, sit stand lift, or a ceiling or mechanical lift. Similarly to the bed mobility section, uh, the healthcare provider starts at the top of the section and must select yes for each checkbox of a particular transfer status. When the answer is yes to all check boxes of a particular transfer status, then that staff status is used for the client. Um, therapy services can also be contacted if you are unsure which transfer status is best for your client. Next. So here we have another video detailing the transfer assessment section. Now we're going to look at the transfer assessment portion of the safe client handling assessment form. Uh, you'll notice that Jen has her shoes on now uh, and that is simply because whenever you're going to get somebody up you do want to have appropriate footwear on for safety and fall prevention. Um, whether or not it's uh, shoes or slippers or um, grip socks it just has to be something that is uh, appropriate and has uh, non-slip uh, capabilities. So we're going to have Jen start with sitting up at the side of the bed. So we're going to go through that same technique of having her bring her knees, uh, bend her knees so that her, her um, feet are on the side of the bed. She's going to roll over onto her side and then she's going to sit up at the side of the bed for us. So she's going to get her legs over the edge. And these are all techniques that um, you will be going through or have gone through in uh, with the safe client handling uh, education. Once Jen is sitting at the side of the bed and you've determined whether she can do that independently or if she's needed one assist or two assist, now we're more looking at what her sitting balance is like. So you'll see there right now that Jen's feet are firmly on the floor. Uh, the, her hips are slightly above uh, her knees just to make the, the, the transfer and positioning um, safe and a, a, a little easier. Um, and now we're going to be looking at Jen's sitting balance. Right now she's got her hands on, on the bed on either side of her. Um, for the assessment, it's kind of nice if they can to put their hands on their lap just because it's a little bit more challenging and you get a better idea. If they need to have their hands on the bed, that's fine. It just is a little indication that they might be having a little bit of a challenge with, with their, their sitting balance. So we're going to start with just challenging her balance a little bit, just having her kind of lean side to side for us. So can she lean over to her left, come back to the middle, and can she lean over to her right? And that way you can determine whether or not if they lose their balance with any of these um, movements. Um, certainly we're, we're looking at it, it, it being challenged. Um, can you lean forward for me? Good. And then can you lean back? And then come back. Good. The next thing we're going to have Jen do is actually straighten out one knee at a time. So we'll get that right one out. And while she's up there, just to pump her ankle back and forth just to see what type of movement we have, further challenging to, to her balance. 
great, and then you can lower it down and then do it with the other leg. Good. Pumping it back and forth about um, three or three or five times is sufficient. Now we're going to look at can Jen raise her arms up in front of her. Good. This type of movement is important because we're looking again at challenging the balance, but also if the stand aid is an option, do, do they have the range in their shoulders to be able to, to reach the handles on the stand aid? Great. Um, obviously, Jen's balance is quite good. If you had uh, someone, a client sitting up at the side of the bed and for some reason, um, you know, they were leaning back and not able to support themselves, or um, they just could not maintain this position at all, stand aid would not be an option. You'd lay them back down onto the bed and then look at using the mechanical lift. But because Jen is standing so well, we're now going to look, or pardon me, sitting so well, we're now going to be looking at having her stand up. We've got appropriate footwear. If Jen was someone that used uh, a walking aid regularly, it would be important to try to include that into the assessment at this point in time too, if it's available. If it's not, then you just kind of kind of go with what you've got. Um, in order to stand up, it's a good idea to have someone just scoot it a little bit closer to the edge of the bed for me if they can. Good. We want their feet underneath their knees there, and then we're going to have you put your hands onto the bed. Good. And we are going to look at having her stand up. So again, you're looking at how much assist does she need to, to do this uh, particular movement. If they're not able to do it on their own or just with some cues and they are requiring some hands-on assist, it's a good idea because it's a, an assessment to use a transfer belt and then you would follow the techniques that, they're, that uh, you're being taught in the safe client handling. So now so we're ready to stand up and obviously Jen doesn't have any issues um, with her balance and her mobility um, from what we're seeing so far. But if you had any concerns at all in terms of uh, the assessment you've done up until this point in terms of, you know, the bridging or the rolling or even the sitting and with, with the balance uh, challenges, you always want to make sure that you're standing in, in a position where you're able to provide uh, assist and in a safe, ready position in terms of having the knees bent and just being prepared to provide assist if, if, if so or if you're, if you're needing it. So um, at this point in time, we'll get Jen to stand up for us. So you're just going to make sure that they're a little bit forward that your feet are underneath your knees, and we'll get you to lean forward for us. Good. And then you're going to stand up. Good. So Jen obviously can stand well. During this procedure, if the person is not able to lean forward, not able to bear weight through their legs, um, that's uh, very indic indicative of the fact that you are going to have to look at some type of mechanical lift. Um, again, if their sitting balance is fine, you could go and, and try the stand aid or the, the Sarah lift. Um, if it's not, then of course you'd be looking at using a, a full mechanical lift. Once we're standing, we're getting a good idea of how much um, support she's needing to stand, so whether she can do it um, on her own without a gate aid, if she can do it on her own uh, holding on to the walker, that's great. Um, if she's needing a little bit of extra support with that, you've got your, your, the transfer belt there to give that little extra support as well. Now we're going to look at uh, Jen's ability to kind of weight shift and take a step. Um, a little easier to kind of get a gauge this by just taking a little bit of step to the side. Um, and then if something's going wrong, we can always help to, to guide back to, to the bed. So Jen, what I'm going to get you to do is just take a small step towards your right for me. Good. And that way we're looking at what is her weight shifting capabilities, okay? Come back to the center for me. Good. And now take a little small step to your left. Good. So we know that she can step on either leg enough and bear weight enough on those legs to, to take a step. After that, and if that's okay, then we'll look at actually taking a step forward. So whichever foot you'd like to start with, Jen, you can take a step forward. Good. And yeah, bring that other foot up with you. Good. And then have her take a step back as well. And again, you're just looking at her ability to bear weight and bear weight safely. So is she doing it on her own? Does she need to have a gate aid there or a walker? Um, is she needing just one minimum assist or is she needing two minimum assist? And just kind of gauging that appropriately. And that is basically uh, the assessment for the transfers. So this is the final section of the Safe Plant Handling Assessment form. And it is the communication section, which um, there are points to check off to indicate that the necessary documentation was done regarding the client's 
specific interventions that were put into place. The healthcare provider then signs and dates the document, which is then placed placed in the alerts directive section of the client's chart. I will now hand over the floor to Nico, who will discuss the ACES screen. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you, Jada. Um, yeah, right now, so we're going to talk about the safe client handling ACES screening tool. Um, so essentially, ACES is a safe client handling tool that was adapted from resources in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, PMH, um, our region, Prayer Mountain Health, found it useful. So they thought it would be a great idea to implement this assessment tool in our, in our uh, facility in our region. Um, PMH um, essentially uses this screening tool to help staff and patients become more aware of the changes in the client's function prior to transferring the client. So um, it's essentially performed prior to any transfers uh, to identify any red flags or concerns. Um, and when concerns are identified based on the screening tool, further assessment is performed before any attempts to transferring the client. Um, so this is encouraged to, to use by everyone, um, especially this, this includes the health care aids. Um, it's just a quick assessment tool. So we'll go over the, the mnemonic here. So um, A stands for alert. So um, you're looking at the client um, to see if they're alert and energetic, are, are they drowsy, um, or do you have to do a sternal rub to wake them up? And then C stands for cooperative. Um, so you're looking at the client, see if they're confused, are they combative? Can they follow instructions? And then E stands for extremities. So essentially this is just um, looking at their um, strength, level. So um, when they're on the bed, uh, like mentioned in the video earlier, are they able to thrust? Um, and when they're on the side of the bed, are they able to flex or extend their knees? Are they able to, uh, do they have any weaknesses on their arms? Um, so you, you're assessing on their strength there, um, that on their extremities. And S stands for sits unsupported. So um, when they're on the side of the bed, do they need to be supported, are they able to support themselves independently? Um, sometimes clients may be able to perform movements well in bed, but they're not able, they don't have that core strength or that midline strength to support themselves um, on the side of the bed. So I think we've all done this to some sort of extent um, to the assessment, but just without the mnemonic. So if let's say the healthcare aid notices any red flags, um, within the client prior to any transfer. Um, they can notify either the PT, OT, or um, the nurse taking care of that client. Um, if let's say the healthcare aid notices that there is one X, uh, which means either uh, the patient's not alert, non-cooperative, they're unable to, they don't have any strength in their extremities um, in their upper and lower body, um, or they can't sit unsupported, those are definitely red flags. And the next step will be to refer to the nurse. The health care would have to refer to the nurse, PT or OT, um, to do further assessment um, before proceeding to any transfer. So it's just essentially a way to prevent injuries. So um, for the next slide here, we will, um, the, the video will show us the ACE the screening tool. It's just a quick two minute video. So we're going to talk a little bit about the ACEs uh, assessment or screening tool. And it's basically a tool that you should use whenever you're going in to move any uh, client. And ACEs stands for alertness or alert, um, cooperative, extremities, and sits unsupported. And so those are basically the, the sections that you're wanting to look at. And it is just a screen. So when you're going into uh, a client's room, are they alert? So are they going to be able to uh, be cooperative and follow instructions? Um, how are their extremities working? Can they extend their knees? Good. And can they can they move their arms? You're wanting to see what are their, their capabilities. Okay. Good. 
And then also looking at basically um, can they sit unsupported? So if they're sitting at the side of the bed or in a chair, are they slouching? Are they, do they have good control over their posture? Uh, if you happen to come into the room and they're lying down in bed, uh, you can also look at their ability to, to bridge in bed uh, as well. If you're finding that there are a, a deficit or there are issues with any of these um, aspects, so they're not alert, they're not moving their extremities, they can't sit unsupported, or they're not cooperative. Um, if you're a healthcare aide, you need to let the nurse know so that a full transfer assessment can be uh, redone or, or completed. Um, and as a nurse, you would need to then go through a complete uh, safe client handling assessment to make sure that we're always doing what is safest for you and for the client. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so now we're going to talk about the safe client handling movement logos. So on admission or um, when the client status changes um, in regards to their mobility or transfer status, um, the nurse, the PT or the occupational therapist, usually they would complete the assessment form, the, the safe client handling assessment form discussed by Jada earlier. Um, and then they would then change the care plan and then the logos are, these logos here that you can see, um, those go into the patient's communication boards. Um, they're usually either highlighted or circled. Um, like you can see there in the pictures, um, there's a comment section um, where staff can provide additional information for each um, client. So, and then there's also a section for dating it. Um, just to see when it was last updated. Um, and if you go into the next slide there, Nancy, um, there is a section for specialized transfer. So let's say, for example, someone uses a slider board. Um, if let's say like a double amputee uses a slider board, um, that, that section is filled out. Um, and, and, and usually, in that situation, um, there is more information. If there is more information that needs to be done, it's either put in the comment section or there is usually a note in the patient's chart about that specialized transfer. Um, yeah, it's just a really cool little tool that we use here in PMH. And if we go into the next slide, um, these are the boards that we use in PMH. So we have the magnetic whiteboard and the non-magnetic non um, poster boards. Um, so essentially the goal is to maximize the use of um, the logos um, for confidentiality reasons. Um, yeah, next slide. Uh, so right here we have the safe client link, client handling communication poster. It's essentially the same idea as the ones that I've previously um, talk to you guys about. So um, this one is not a permanent record. It does not go into the patient's chart. This, um, you essentially do the same thing. If, if say the patient is independent transfer, you circle it or highlight that transfer. Um, and then it goes into the communication board. Um, and sometimes, but sometimes you'll see orders such as like one to two assists. Um, for that instance, uh, the goal of, of PMH is to always choose the higher level of support. Um, so in that instance, you would circle two assist. When, when the order says one to two assist, you'd circle two assist. Um, also, um, there's also a comment section um, because every patient is different. And they have their own specific needs. Next slide, please. So in PMH, uh, training is done in person, and we have five sites where we do it. Um, and there's, so there's Killarney. I don't know if you guys are aware of these little towns. Um, Killarney, Verdon, Dauphin, Swan River, and Brandon. Um, and that usually takes about uh, six and a half hours. The training is six and a half hours, um, and it's often done once a month. Um, this is so essential to have those other sites available because there's... Um, there's many areas um, in rural um, parts where staff needs training and it's just, it's just easier access for them if they're close to that facility. Next slide. 
Uh, so this one over here is our intranet page for PMH. Um, so when during COVID, when they're unable to do um, the in-person staff training, um, there are videos available in the safe client, client handling part of our um, SharePoint, uh, our intranet page. Um, and that's where staff can access um, the videos available. And it goes through a detailed information of, of how to safely use the transfers and uh, to safely transfer patients and uh, protect the staff as well. Um, Watching these videos are not considered official training because it doesn't provide the same learning experience as the in-person hands-on training does. So essentially, um, yeah, it's just a quick reference for, for um, staff if they're having trouble with certain areas of, of, of the transfers, they can quickly watch those videos. Um, um, due to COVID, um, the in-person training stopped actually in March, 2020 and staff were encouraged to watch the training video was available then. And then in May, 2021, training had resumed with smaller classes for about uh, four staff members. Um, and they usually did about 10 to 12 training sessions um, before training was shut down again in June, 2021. So fortunately right now, um, there is a plan to start training again on November 23rd um, this year. So exciting news. We go on to the next slide. Um, this is the safe client handling competency checklist. So this checklist um, is completed by the trainer or the educator. Um, this is the six and a half hour class um, education in-person hands-on training that is completed when the employees uh, first get hired. And then it is done um, every three years after that. Um, that checklist is essentially completed every training. So um, really our main goal here, here is just to stress the importance of uh, safe client handling education and the benefits it can have in protecting um, staff and clients. Uh, our next slides here are just our references. Um, yeah, <laughs> we hope you enjoyed our presentation. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. And now we have an opportunity if there's any questions, Michelle. Um, I promised the students that after they did a fabulous job presenting that I would take the pressure off of them and I would do all the answering of the questions. So if there's any, I am able to take those now. Awesome. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A box, so uh, we'll get to those momentarily. Before we do, I'll just um, uh, plug a reminder for the Community of Practice's uh, online communication tool, which is Loop. Um, so if you're not already a member, um, the, the links to register are, are provided there. Also, um, I'll provide those in kind of a follow-up email to all of um, our uh, attendees today. Um, you'll also receive, we had a couple of questions about this, so I'll just reiterate that you'll receive a, a link to the recording of this webinar, um, and which will also be made available on the web. Um, and you'll also receive a, a link to the slides. Uh, you do have to be a loop member to uh, access the slides, so keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, those were just a, a couple of other housekeeping items I wanted to uh, chat about before we uh, got into the questions. The last one is that there will be um, a evaluation survey that pops up when uh, when the webinar ends or when you exit the webinar. Um, so you'll be redirected to Zoom and invited to participate in a short evaluation survey. So uh, please fill that out so that we can continue to offer uh, high quality webinars for you um, and uh, cover topics that you are interested in and would uh, improve your, your practice uh, and your work. So without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll jump into the questions. Uh, so the first one here was from Phyllis. Um, they're just wondering, uh, will the assessment forms, um, the examples that you shared, will those be made available um, in, a, in a document or a PDF? Are those shareable, Nancy? Um, those have already been made available to Loop, so they should be. 
All right. And so are they, um, are they posted? Um, whereabouts could someone on loop find them? That's a good question. <laughs> we will have to make sure that we know where they are. All right. Um, yeah. yeah. Cause I know that I did share them. So. Great. Um, and the next one is from Taryn. Um, they were wondering if you could share an example of when you might be using a three person slide sheet transfer. Um, they're just curious why you would do this versus using a mechanical lift to, do you have the answer to that at that at this time? I do not. Yeah, no worries. Um, we can we can follow up on that. Um, we'll have Taryn's uh, communication coordinates, um, so we'll be able to to follow up. Maybe we can loop back with um, uh, with someone who might know the answer to that. The only thing that I could think of potentially um is if we were at a rural location where they um had a, an equipment malfunction and so there was no equipment available to do um a mechanical lift um when we're dealing with so many rural locations that's a real possibility hmm. for sure Thank you. And the next question is from Jim. Um, what considerations are in place in the event of emergency evacuations? How are the various patients moved quickly and safely to safety, especially when stairs are involved? Essentially, um, how can safe patient handling be transitioned into different situational environments to avoid potential injury? Well, I think when you're faced with an emergency situation, you're going to try to get people out as quickly as possible. Um, and so you would probably be trying to provide them with the maximum level of support you could in order to get them into a wheelchair or onto a bed or something to get them out of the facility. Um, it's probably not a a time when you could stop and look at every single person's board to determine how to transfer them the, the safest. So as Deco said before, you would try to um, go up a level if you could uh, and try to uh, make sure that you get the people out. That's the important thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. The next one um, is from a, a namesake of mine, Michelle. Um, competency Hi, Michelle. in evangeline. It was mentioned that uh, renewal happens every three years. Just wondering how you came uh, to three years, that decision. Um, that wasn't a decision that I was privy to, so I'm not really sure. I'm thinking um, just off the top of my head, it makes sense that people's skill sets are reevaluated. Um, and when you're thinking, uh, we probably, uh, we have almost 8,000 employees. So not all of them obviously are going to be undergoing the training, but it is a significant uh, thing just to get through the entire organization for the staff to get them trained. Um, mm -hmm. So it would make sense to, uh, to have at least a little period of time in between. Um, they probably just get them all done and then have to start again, right? Yeah. All righty, the next question, I've got one other in the chat box, uh, one in the Q&A box rather, and then I, I got one in the chat box that I'll share. Oh, another one is in. Um, so Lorraine asks, what are your policies around one versus two person assist uh, for use of mechanical lift devices? There you go. Another question I can't answer. See, <laughs> this is the difficulty is I'm not actually a clinician. Yeah. Um, so I did not actually write the policy or have any involvement in it. So I'm not able to do that. I don't know if Trisha Fisher's online. Oh, Trisha. Yeah, Trisha, just put in the Q&A box. Um, two person for mechanical lifts. Here we go. She's my co-chair and she's my right-hand person. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Trisha. And she um, helped to write a lot of this, the assessment forms and that sort of thing. So, well, Trisha, feel free to continue to chime in if there's anything uh, that Perfect. you can inform. Um, but uh, 
Phyllis asks also, um, could you please discuss the best way to transfer from bed to commode if client's walking ability is very limited due to leg weakness? Um, that again is a pretty clinical uh, question. Um, uh, maybe one of my students could answer that. I, I think like the assessment form, like, that, like if there's a weakness, like that's a good sign to use that assessment form that Jada went over with. And I think like there are check boxes there that applies um, to each um, patient. If, and if they line up to those check boxes, then that would be the most appropriate transfer for the patient. Awesome. Um, Thanks, Nico. I don't know if Trisha has. <laughs> No, nothing. Uh, well, Trisha also offered some more information about the mechanical lift. Um, for the earlier question, we would also prefer to use a mechanical lift uh, rather with rather than with three person slide transfer. So hopefully that uh, adds a little yep. bit of detail. Um, and I think Lorraine has a follow-up question. Um, what about in the community? Getting to healthcare workers is usually difficult, if not impossible. Um, and that's when you would rely heavily upon your therapies team to come up with ways in which to transfer a, a person safely using only one staff member. Right. So, so whether that's the... Uh, addition of of some equipment within the home environment, uh, whatever the clinicians would determine that. Right. And um, the next question from Kim, I saw that you use transfer belts, but I didn't see them in the transfer logos. Um, what is your policy on the use of transfer belts? So we certainly do have them. I think you noticed, um, Nico went over how there's a, like a specialized one. That's what you would use for that one. Awesome. Um, and another question, oh, I think I see it twice in here. Um, could you suggest any techniques or tips for safe transferring from bed to commode? Well, what do my students think? I believe it's mostly about the assessments that are done um, when the patient is admitted. Um, like we said earlier, when the assessments are done, we determine um, the best transfer method for the patient. So if it is required to transfer the patient by a mechanical lift, then that would be the best option when transferring such a patient to the commode. And I have seen um, from my clinical experience, for some independent patients, the most um, used technique is the pivot transfer transferring patients to, um, to the commode. However, it is suggested to go by um, the assessment that has been completed. It is safest to go by that assessment and to transfer the patient using that um, status that has been determined from those um, assessment forms. Awesome. Sorry, Michelle. Just to go back to that, um, that uh, previous question about the transferring walking belt assist, there is a section there. There is um, there is a logo that talks about it. Like um, I don't know what slide number, but it, it it does say it there. Oh, there is one. Yeah. Okay. Walking Great. Belt. Yeah. Perfect. I think we just showed a sampling of some of the uh, the logos and did get all of them. So there you go. Awesome. Um, and. Uh, one of our uh, askers just thanks you for thanks you for the specific suggestions. So so thank you guys. Um, and then Trisha had uh, thrown in some some comments. Um, so she said that the community has different guidelines and do not use one uh, one person assist. I'm assuming that means. Um, uh, and then it says we use the same transfers. I, I don't know actually what question that was referring to, um, but thank Probably you. Probably in the community. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Trisha, for, for that additional uh, color to, to answer those questions. Um, we've got one minute left, so um, I will wrap up. Uh, I do want to, uh, oh, wait, one, one more comment for Trisha. In PMH, we actually do not recommend pivot transfer. Our policy is standing stepping transfers to prevent rotation injuries to staff and clients. Um, so thank you again, oh. Trisha. So um, in our last moments, I'll, I'll thank you, uh, Nancy and Yvonne, Jada and Nico, you did a, a fantastic job. Um, there's lots of positive feedback in the chat box, which I'll be sending you guys. Great. So thank you again for such a wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, we would love to, to see you um, present for us again. And uh, I hope everyone has a, a wonderful day and enjoyed the presentation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.